Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Sales Think Tank from LinkedIn, the show that brings you sales thought leadership from sales industry experts. My name is Jack McKeown, Sales Director for EMEA at LinkedIn Sales Solutions, and I am delighted to be your host today. In this episode, we'll be discussing the state of sales in the United Kingdom, where it's been, where it's at, and more importantly, where it's going. Uh, LinkedIn recently published our annual research report, The State of Sales, which surveyed around 3,000 B2B buyers and sellers in the UK, taking the nation's pulse of salespeople and unearthing a host of interesting findings for us to mull over today. And joining me to tackle this topic are a number of sales industry experts from LinkedIn. Now, before I let them introduce themselves to you, I've got one or two small housekeeping items to mention. Firstly, a recording of this show will be available afterwards on the LinkedIn Sales Solutions website and our social channels. And secondly, and more importantly, we have got a team in the background ready to answer any questions you have today. So please drop them into the Q&A box on your viewing console and we will get back to you. Get involved, let's keep it nice and interactive for everybody. Now, without further ado, let's get familiar with our panel of experts for today's episode. And here at LinkedIn, we like to kick things off with a little icebreaker, and that is to ask our guests to tell us something that is not on their LinkedIn profile. First, I will go to you, Paul. Hi, Jack. Um, what's not on my LinkedIn profile? Well, most recently in front of mind for me is that just two weeks ago at the end of August, I completed my first ever triathlon. Now, I, I, I got to stress, it's a sprint triathlon, and you can, you can take out the word sprint and replace it with the word baby. Uh, as in, it's a baby triathlon. <laughs> Still triathlon. But I am nonetheless proud. Now, yeah. it was very short in every aspect of it, but uh, it was just something I got in my head I wanted to try, and uh, nice. behind me now, thankfully. And so it what wasn't was the awful. distance of this So triathlon? it was a 750 meter swim, a 20 kilometer bicycle ride, and a five kilometer run. So. Still a little bit serious. I'm getting tired just thinking about that. That's, uh, <laughs> that's good. Okay, very interesting, Paul. Well played. Thank you. And uh, if we can go to London, to you, Becky. Hey, Jack, and hi, everybody in the room. I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you for having me. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Becky Schnaufer, and I head up LinkedIn's talent solutions business in the UK. Now, talent solutions covers uh, multiple aspects of an employee life cycle, from hiring, learning and development, uh, right the way through to retention. Um, but as for something that's not on my LinkedIn profile, in my youth, I say youth, um, I was an avid footballer. Um, played a lot of football. So the last few weeks and months of uh, the Women's UEFA Cup has made for amazing um, watching, with the final being absolutely exceptional. So, uh, yeah, I was there cheering for the Lionesses and um, probably living my best life over the last couple of months, seeing so much uh, women's football being played and being uh, broadcast on the telly. A former Premier League footballer, Becky, and a trailblazer for what we are seeing go on in the women's game today. I am suddenly a lot less impressed by Paul's triathlon. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Shane, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and something not on your LinkedIn profile. Thanks, Jack, and hi to everyone. I'm Shane, and I manage our economic graph research and insights team based here in Dublin that covers the EMEA region. And our job is to use the data and insights from LinkedIn's economic graph to explain what's going on in the world of work and how that aligns with global and country economic trends. Um, I have fond memories of living in the UK and one of the things on my LinkedIn profile uh, when I was in the UK was that I dabbled in a bit of amateur dramatics, uh, culminating in a role that was quite typecast as an Irish jockey. And looking at me now, you probably assume that must have been really a stretch of the imagination to imagine me as an Irish jockey, but there you go. That was needs must, I think, at the time. Ah, oh, fantastic. So you're uh, well adept at the studio setting, and uh, look, you transformed yourself into a jockey and now into an economist. <laughs> uh, a man of many talents, Shane, absolutely. Very good at convincing people of what I'm saying. That's the, the, important, uh, the important line, yeah. Fantastic. <clears throat> Uh, well, if I can get into the questions today then, guys, uh, I'll, I'll start with Paul and Becky. We have seen a lot of change through the pandemic in the world of work and in our industry, in sales specifically. Um, what do you see as the most positive changes that have come through this time? Well, let me go first then. Um, I would say, for me, the most positive outcome so far has been the demise of 
undifferentiated, high volume, cold outreach. Uh, even more so today, post pandemic, that is a less appropriate way of engaging your potential customers and your customers than it was before. Um, simply throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks just doesn't work anymore. The, not, least of which, not least of the reasons for which is that the wall is gone. Right? Yeah. The wall has moved. Yeah. What we've got is 75% uh, of buyers in the UK say that they want to work remotely at least part of the time. Nearly two thirds of them are already working remotely. Yeah. So they're not sitting at the end of a fixed line telephone number. They're not sitting in an office that you can come to visit any longer. So you have to be demonstrating a deep understanding of your buyer's circumstances as you initiate that initial connection. And if you don't, you're, you're dead in the water. Absolutely. And we have, you know, in our report this year, top performing buyers have been telling us exactly that. And, and we talk about top performing buyers as those doing over 140% of their quota, right? Sellers, so I think you Sellers, know. sorry, thank you, no Paul. Worries. Our top performing sellers, who we see as doing over 140% of quota, they are telling us exactly what you just said. So 82% of them are saying they never reach out to anybody anymore without doing research first. And I think that's good for buyers, it's good for sellers, it's good for everybody, really. And uh, I agree with you that that genie is out of the bottle. Yeah. Becky, what do you see? I mean, so much, so much good stuff said there. Um, I'm probably just going to be saying very similar things. But I think for me, it, it, the whole last couple of years has given um, the world of sales the time to pivot. You know, we, we could all see that buyers' needs were shifting that they wanted a different journey and experience. Um, but the transformation of how we sell wasn't happening at the pace needed by our clients. Um, the pause that the pandemic initially gave, it, it made us all have to rethink, both on the buyers and the sellers' side. I think for the sellers, it afforded us the opportunity to dig deeper, to lean into digital tools and data insights more readily. And for the buyer, I think it helped them become more selective, to do more research and demand more partnership and thought leadership from their sales partners. You know, it was a difficult time, you know, make, make no mistake. Um, but I think for the, in the world of sellers and buyers, it kind of made us all up our game. Yeah, absolutely. I, could, I couldn't agree more. I, you know, I think a few of us in this room are, are well, should we say uh, not millennials uh, and, and working in this industry for a long time have never seen so much change as we have seen in the last couple of years. It's gone, it's gone really quickly. Um, if, I can, if I can go to you, Shane, you know, the economist, probably the smart guy in the room, uh, we might say, uh, and if you can keep it simple for, for all of us, um, how do you see the macroeconomic outlook for the United Kingdom affecting the sales industry over the coming year or two? And, and what is the LinkedIn data telling us? Well, Jack, I guess the context uh, for a lot of what we're seeing in the UK macroeconomic outlook at the moment is sort of glass half full, glass half empty sort of approach. If we take the glass half empty approach, first of all, we know that you know, the U British economy has shrunk by 0.1% in the, in the last quarter as reported. Uh, we know that inflation is outstripping uh, wage growth uh, at the moment as well. The Bank of England has obviously uh, previewed an interest rate rise that has uh, been announced recently. But then at the other side of the, the, the equation, the glass half full side, which is where LinkedIn data gives a really unique insight, we see that employment is strong. Uh, in the UK, the unemployment rate in the UK is 3.8 percent. That's really low in a historical in a historical context. But if we dig below that and look exactly what's happening on our platform and what the LinkedIn data is telling us, we know that hiring is up, and there was meteor meteoric rise in hiring last year immediately after the lifting of restrictions. We're seeing that still maintain really strong levels, really solid levels of employment in the economy. But over June and July, we're seeing it start to slow. And that might be previewing some of the general sentiment out there around the direction in which the British economy is going. More importantly, when we look at those applications to jobs that are taking place in the platform, we see that for the first time in nearly 10 months, it, there are more applicants for a job on LinkedIn than there would have been previously. And there are more applicant, more applicants 
applicants are doing more applications as well for the first time in 10 months as well. So showing that it's getting a bit busier, it's getting a bit harder, there still is a lot of vacancies around. They're not quite the record level high as they were a few months ago, but they are pretty high. So there is you know, scope for looking at this indicator of what's happening in the labour market as a general direction of the economy. But at the moment, the labour market is pretty strong. And how that dials into the sales industry then is when firms take this outlook of where they're going to go over the next three to five years, where are they going to make their spending? And that's where value needs to be created. They are going to make tough decisions, they're going to make informed decisions about where the best place to spend is. And that value and that value proposition is what's really important to the sales industry as well. Very interesting. It's, it's, it's a developing picture right now. Very much so. And that's where, again, I think LinkedIn data comes into its own, where we can look at exactly that direction of what's happening with hiring, and that'll give us an indication of what the shape of the economy will look like over the next three to five months. And that's where I think sales leaders need to be looking at, because that will give the overall picture of the health of that economy with regard to where they need to go with their sales business. Great, great. Um, we've got some interesting stats we're going to get to that are UK specific, one or two that I found quite surprising, and we'll get to them in a couple of questions. But I'd love to go to you now, Becky, and talk a little bit about sales technology. What is the most useful thing sales technology can do for a salesperson or sales team in the UK in 2022? I mean, there's a lot of technology out there, right? <clears throat> um, I think uh, one of the uh, the data points in the in the the, um, the recent study shows that the average sales tech stack has 13 virtual selling technologies. So when we talk about <clears throat> excuse me, we talk about um, sales technology. In my opinion, it's multifaceted. So first of all. We have the technology that connects people. And, you know, let's be honest, we're rather good at using it now. I'm talking about solutions such as Teams and Zoom that allows sellers to be connected virtually as well as face-to-face. -face. And as Paul said um, earlier, I think it was with 70% of buyers saying that they'll continue to work remotely at least some of the time. Adopting and using that technology is imperative to salespeople's successes. Um, next up for me, I would dig into Sales Navigator, and I know that you know everyone's going to think that I would say that, but but sort of hear me out. Warm outreach is king. Okay, that's not to say that there isn't a place for cold calling. There always will be, but we know that sales and and good selling stems from trust, uh, relationship, connection, introductions that are made through someone else, and and with context always um, land the best, and that's where. Sales Navigator, that kind of technology can help out. And I think lastly, and in my opinion, the most important, it's insights or data. We've entered a very um, personalized world, if you will. For a salesperson having data that's relevant to the customer or the client, that is imperative. So researching, being able to give constructive advice and thought leadership as you progress through the sales cycle, through a sales campaign, that's going to elevate your position with your client. It's going to forge a much stronger relationship. And at the end of the day, it's going to deliver the most, um, the most value. I think, you know, to, to, to summarize, really, the technology that affords you to best support your client is your friend. That's what you have to lean into. Yeah, I think what we're hearing is it's not just about more sales tech, it's about more of the right sales tech. And that's what we're hearing our top performing sellers and selling teams are, are really doing. They're picking the right sales tech and they're, they're going into it deep and embedding it in their, in their work. If I may add to that, actually, I, I, I would... I would look at it through two different lenses. One is what can this, what will the sales tech do for the organization and what will it do for the individual sales professional? For the organization, and particularly looking at the UK, um, you know, there, 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 there is now the opportunity to be a global first provider of whatever service those companies are providing. You don't need to be restricted to the island, to the region. It's not a local first and then grow it out from there. And so understanding where the opportunity lies globally is a gateway through which you know, sales technology can bring you. Um, and again, you know, leveraging the LinkedIn platform, leveraging the, the, the global nature of, of, of the, the, the firmonomics, uh, firmographics rather, as well as the individual data, will allow UK companies to understand where those pockets of opportunity outside of their home country. 
at an individual level, sales tech, the, 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 the top takeaway for individuals is to help them prioritize, reprioritize, and reprioritize again in, in a moment. Um, as time is, uh, is the only finite resource that that individual will have access to, they have their territory as a sales professional, but that territory is not created equally. And in fact, it's shifting all the time with triggers and changes and developments that happen at, at an industry, an account, and indeed an individual buyer level. And being able to track and act upon those changes as they happen is going to allow that sales professional to spend their time much more effectively. So any technology that allows them to do that is a win for me. And we heard, of course, recently, Paul, or, or a long time ago at this point, really, that data is the new oil, right? <clears throat> and, and data is critical to a salesperson today. Salespeople having information on buyers is really the differentiator. Mm. What data should salespeople have and where can they get it from? So I think it's, it's important that we don't conflate data and information. So for me anyway, and I don't think this is a definition written down anywhere in the world, but for me, data is the what and information is the so what, right? So you know, we talk about changes in your account base and whatnot. Data is being able to track decision makers changing jobs, changing companies. Information is being able to overlay that on your pipeline, on your account base, on your territory, and then understanding what the implications are for you. So a very simple example, in the very survey that we're talking about, the UK State of Sales survey, we learned that more than half of the buyers surveyed have bought a service from their sales professionals previously. I haven't explained that well, but if, they're, if they've bought something from you before as a sales professional, there's more than half of them buy from you again, either in their current capacity or in a new capacity. So if you can track your decision makers, your happy clients, as they move from company to company, and then overlay that with your territory, with your pipeline, that helps you to prioritize really actionable information to help you accelerate your sales cycles, make wins, and you know, bring success to those buyers again in their new environment. So that's information. The data is being able to track those changes at a, at a, at a macro level, at scale. Beautifully put, Paul, the, the difference between data and information. I love it. Thank you. And <laughs> I think what we're learning is there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of good news there for salespeople that are taking the lessons from the information at their disposal mm -hmm. right now and, and what they can do with that. Yeah, for sure. And it's a, it's a whole new world. We have access to data and information that we've never had before. The problem is separating the signal from the noise. Yeah. Right? We can be overwhelmed by that and, and, and paralyzed, therefore. And so we need to be able to figure out which ones are meaningful to me right now and how do I act upon that? Yeah. What's my next best action? Yeah. One stat, I might go to you, Becky, one stat that caught my eye in the UK State of Sales report this year, and it caught my eye for two reasons. One, it's that three quarters of salespeople are telling us that they have had a deal either lost or delayed by a key decision maker leaving the account they're working with. And that kind of, I had two emotive reactions to that. One, three quarters is a big number, right? That's most people, but, but who are the quarter that haven't, right? Because working, <laughs> working in sales for a long time, it seems to happen to, to everybody. Knowing this, Becky, and, and knowing what we know about you know, how often you know, key decision makers move roles and how that affects the salesperson, what, what can we do with that information? Mm, okay, well, this is this is the multi-thread, Jack, isn't it? You know, we, we talk about it a lot. We talk about it all the time, but it, it has to be done. If you only have one connection, you just speak to one person in your, 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 your client, the chances are you're on the back foot, whether that's uh, because of risk of them leaving or whether that's just because the competition are going to be speaking to more people. Um, it's incredibly rare for one person to hold um, all of the cards on a purchasing decision. Um, you know, the, the buying circle, if you will, continues to, um, to increase. So you've got to get ahead of the game. You've got to look at the circle of influence um, at your client. You've got to get sponsors, influence, advisors, 
that way, if someone does move, you have someone else um, to go to. And at the moment, um, if you think about in light of the, the great reshuffle, this is something we, we need to expect is going to happen. Yeah. So if you multi-thread, if you build out that, that wider relationship um, network in your client, you have the least chance of slowing or stopping a sale. I think the other piece of advice would, you've got to make your business case watertight. That means really getting under the covers of what your client's objectives are, what challenges they face and how your solution can add value to them in overcoming those challenges and meeting their objectives. If you have multiple relationships and you're aligned on the client's objectives, you have far more chance of staying the course. And that kind of doubles back really to what Paul was just saying around data and information. OK, you know, you've really got to be going meeting the customer where they are and digging deep, understanding what they're trying to achieve, and then demonstrating the value and the support that you can give to them and to help them achieve that. Um, and, and then finally, you know, um, Paul, again, you just sort of alluded to that in, your, in your, your last answer, but when decision makers do leave, and they will, oftentimes they go somewhere else. 52% um, of buyers say that they've purchased from a sales rep that they were a client of at a previous company. So it makes sense to stay in touch. Yes, opportunity is everywhere if you, if you put the work in and keep your eyes open, right? And you touched on something there, Becky, that I found very interesting. I mentioned at the top of the show we had a stat where the UK really stands alone from everybody else. A, a little over a decade ago in 2011, the corporate executive board brought us the challenger sale where mm. you know, they laid down that now there were 5.4 decision makers involved in, in each buying decision in a B2B sale. And every couple of years they've revised that to you know, that number up, that stat up. We've done a lot of work on this over the last few years. And in our UK state of sales report, we have discovered now, and we've done a bunch of these state of sales reports all around the world, and the UK stands alone above all other markets with 13 decision makers involved in the average B2B buying decision. Uh, my question to, to Shane and Paul is, you know, why is it that, that these buying committees or that these buying decisions are becoming so complex and so large? I think, Jack, it comes back to what I mentioned at the top of the show, which is people are looking for more value when they're making making spending on behalf of their firm or their business. And that brings with an added level of scrutiny as well. And Paul rightly pointed to the fact that data and information exists. Not only does that exist from our end, but it also exists from the customer end as well. They're also exposed to the same amount of data and the same amount of information, and they probably have developed a capacity and expertise in interpreting what that means. So by seeing an increase in the size of the buying committee, the bar is being raised, certainly, but I think the prize then ultimately, if you maintain and create that relationship and it persists, persists over time, as the state of sales report has told us, that a 50% figure, figure holds through, that that scrutiny, that extra scrutiny, can actually bring with it extra reward for businesses that want to sell to those folks. So it underlines the importance of being able to make that distinction between data and insight, and to be able to show exactly that not only do you understand the context within which your client is operating, but you have a product or an avenue for them to further exploit that context for their benefit uh, as well. Yeah. I would say in addition to that, the, these decisions are becoming more federated because more people have an opinion and a stake in what the outcome of that decision is, right? So when I would have started out in sales, the CIO or the chief technology officer or the IT department made the technology purchasing decisions and then they turned around and they told the business what they had bought and the business had to get on with it and you know just adopt it. That is no longer the case. In a world where services are highly transferable, switch on, switch off, in a SaaS environment, um, usage, and engagement from the end user population is absolutely critical. And if it doesn't come up to snuff, you know, at day 364, there is no day 365 for that service. So salespeople now really have to got, get to not only the economic buyer, but also to the, the people who are going to be leveraging that service and voting with their feet come renewal time. Yeah, it's a much deeper selling process to be successful and a much greater focus on value. Absolutely, yeah, which is a huge, hugely positive development. Gone are the days when, you know, 
the contract was signed mm. and the next day a, a truck backed up with a whole bunch of technology that got stuffed into the basement and you were on the hook for it for the next 5, 10, 15 years because yeah. the rip and replace was just too painful. Yeah. Now it's a very, uh, the barriers to exit for a client are much lower yeah. and that's a huge positive. Yeah, the days of salespeople just getting checks signed and heading to the pub, <laughs> uh, those, those days are long gone. Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> as well I think as well Jack there's one of the there's one of the sort of point to make on that and, and we've seen this happen um, before in previous years where budgets have been tightened that that process for sign off changes as well and so whilst we're talking about that buying circle growing I think as we see the next kind of you know months or so play out it's really important that people dig back in to that sign off process because this is an opportunity for companies to restructure or tighten um, that that kind of that buying cycle, that that buying process, um, and I think where oftentimes where we see people get caught out is where they make the assumption that it's going to be the same way as it was last time. So this is a good time to check and to test and to see whether any changes um, have occurred in the uh, in, in in the buying cycle in that sign off process. Great. I think I've got time for one last question for the panel. And for anybody watching online, please drop your questions um, in the comments box and we'll, we'll get back to you. But to the panel, one last question is, post-pandemic, how have UK buyers' expectations changed? And do you see it as different to other regions? Oh, um, so how they have changed, I believe... And, and forgive me to the audience if I'm zeroing in too much on the technology world. I know there are people who aren't selling technology today, but I am going to just think about technology for a moment. B2B buyers are first and foremost, they are consumers. You know, from 6 p.m. onwards every weekday and throughout the weekend, they're consumers. And they've become uh, attuned to a superlatively highly personalized sale and service from their consumer brands like Netflix and Spotify and Amazon and whatever. And then from nine till six on a Monday to Friday, they're typically not getting that same level of customization, personalization, engagement from their B2B buyers. And I think there's a, there's a, a revolt almost against that, that they are punishing those organizations that, that don't make that leap, that don't meet those expectations. Um, and they are rewarding those that do. So I think that's a change that we're seeing develop, and I think that's a global change as well, but possibly led by the UK. So in sales tech, we've all got to work harder because Netflix has done such a good bloody job well, over yeah, the last decade. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you all very much. Uh, we'll have to leave it there as that's all we've got time for today, though we could probably talk about this topic all day. I would like to thank all my guests for taking part in our show and for sharing with us their expertise. And to you, our audience, for joining us today. We hope you've got a few useful takeaways from our discussion. And we hope to see you again soon for another episode of the LinkedIn Sales Think Tank. Remember, you can still ask any last minute questions in the Q&A box and we will respond to you. Alternatively, we got loads of sales resources available to you on our website or by following the LinkedIn Sales Solutions blog. That's it for now. Thank you all and have a great day.